Open your Bibles, please, to the 13th chapter of Matthew. Matthew chapter 13. Seven parables our Lord spoke, recorded here in this 13th chapter of Matthew. They are the mysteries of the kingdom of heaven. The only place in the New Testament you find that phrase, principally because here in the Gospel of Matthew, the Lord Jesus is presented as king. These mysteries of the kingdom of heaven tell us what we may expect, what will occur during this period of time while the king is in exile. The nobleman has departed to the far country to receive a kingdom and to return. What may we expect in the realm of profession in Christendom during this time while the king is in exile, while he is in rejection? The truth that we learn from this chapter, from these parables, is truth that uh, is not seen in the prophets. Verse 17. Our Lord said, For assuredly I say to you that many prophets and righteous men desired to see what you see and did not see, to hear what you hear and did not hear. The disciples, of course, did not understand that the Lord Jesus was going to die. They are on that last journey to Jerusalem. They are on the route from Jericho to Jerusalem. And our Lord speaks to them that parable concerning the nobleman. He spoke the parable, and we're told this in Luke 19, because they thought that the kingdom would immediately appear. It was the time of the feast, one of three feasts that required every male in Israel to come to Jerusalem. No doubt the highways were packed with people, and they were headed that direction, and the air was charged. And the disciples thought, now's the time for him to break the yoke of Rome, for him to declare himself king, to establish the kingdom. And because they were thinking this, though they did not voice it audibly, the Lord Jesus spoke the parable and said, no, in effect there's going to be a period of time between the departure of the nobleman for the far country to receive the kingdom and his return when his servants will give an accounting. Actually, after his death and resurrection, just before his ascension, his disciples asked the question, and it's recorded in the first chapter of Acts, Wilt thou at this time restore the kingdom to Israel? These mysteries of the kingdom of heaven speak of things that had been hidden from the foundation of the world. You read that in verse 35. They are the state of things in the realm of profession while Christ is absent. In a number of these parables you find both the true and the false, both the good and the bad. In other words, let me put it this way, that in these parables you do not find the state of the true church, but you find the conditions in Christendom, which takes in all of the profession. Let's read together, please, beginning at verse 24. Another parable he put forth to them, saying, that word, another, is an important word. It means another of the same kind. So whatever our Lord taught in the first parable, of course, he did not deny or change in the second parable. Another parable he put forth to them, saying, the kingdom of heaven is like a man who sowed good seed in his field. But while men slept, his enemy came and sowed tares among the wheat and went his way. But when the grain had sprouted and produced a crop, then the tares also appeared. So the servants of the owner came and said to him, Sir, did you not sow good seed in your field? How then does it have tares? He said to them, An enemy 
has done this. The servant said to him, Do you want us then to go and gather them up? But he said, No, lest while you gather up the tares, you also uproot the wheat with them. Let both grow together until the harvest, and at the time of harvest I will say to the reapers, First gather together the tares and bind them in bundles to burn them, but gather the wheat into my barn. Let's read also our Lord's interpretation of the parable, beginning at verse 36. Then Jesus sent the multitude away, went into the house, and his disciples came to him, saying, Explain to us the parable of the tares of the field. He answered and said to them, He who sows the good seed is the Son of Man. The field is the world. The good seeds are the sons or children of the kingdom. But the tares are the sons of the wicked one. The enemy who sowed them is the devil, and the harvest is the end of the age. And the reapers are the angels. Therefore, as the tares are gathered and burned in the fire, so it will be at the end of this age. The Son of Man will send out his angels, and they will gather out of his kingdom all things that offend, and those who practice lawlessness, and will cast them into the furnace of fire. There will be wailing and gnashing of teeth. Then the righteous shall shine forth as the sun in the kingdom of their father, he who has ears to hear, let him hear. This chapter begins with the words, the same day. It was the same day in which the king was rejected by the leaders of Israel, the religious leaders. It was the same day in which they blasphemed the Holy Spirit. It was the same day in which our Lord said, no sign to be given this evil and adulterous generation, but the sign of the prophet Jonah. It was the same day when his mother and brethren came and desired to speak with him, and he said, Who is my mother and my brothers? Pointing to his disciples, he said, These are my mother and my brothers, and whoever does the will of the Father in heaven, the same is my mother, my brother, my sister. And then he spoke these parables to his disciples. This second parable is the parable of the tares, and the emphasis in this parable is upon the tares. Quite often in the Word of God, two is the number of division. It was on the second day that God divided the light from the darkness, the waters under the firmament, from the waters above it. In the first parable, the parable of the sower, you have described the work of Christ and his servants. In the second parable, you have described the work of Satan, an enemy. In the first parable, there were four portions of seed. Some fell by the wayside, some fell on stony ground, some fell among thorns. But some fell on good ground and brought forth fruit. There were three sources of opposition to the sowing of that seed. Satan, the flesh, and the world. But some seed fell in good ground. Do you suppose that Satan is content to allow that seed that fell into good ground to remain unhindered? Of course not. And here the enemy, in the very field where that seed has been sown and has produced fruit, goes in and sows tares right among the wheat. You'll notice a change in the two parables in this respect, that in the first parable, the seed represents the Word, the Word of God or the Word of the Kingdom. In the second parable, the seed are the children 
of the kingdom. Is there any discrepancy there? Of course not. Like, L-I-K-E, produces like. We are born again, not of corruptible seed, but of incorruptible, by the word of God, which lives and abides forever. Paul said in Galatians 3.26, Ye are all the children of God through faith in Jesus Christ. 1 Corinthians 4.15, Paul said, In Christ Jesus I have begotten you through the gospel. And again in James 1.18, Of his own will begot he us. How? With the word of truth. And we are born again by the incorruptible word of God. New life never comes through lifeless forms and ceremonies. It is the living spirit using the living word that produces children of God. The spirit of God using the word of God. Except a man be born of water and of the Spirit, he cannot enter or see the kingdom of God. You will notice, please, in verse 38, the children of the wicked one. Fields the world, good seeds, the children of the kingdom. The tares are the children or sons of the wicked one. Word for tares here, xenonia, only time it's used. Uh, in the New Testament is right here. It's, it's a spurious wheat. It's a darnel, something that resembles the real in stock and ears. Actually, in the time of Christ, tares were a poisonous weed, and yet it looked like the real grain. I'm convinced, dear friends, that we often confuse what the work of Satan is. Walk down the street and uh, see a drunken derelict in the ditch, and someone says, poor fella, he's gone to the devil. No, he's not gone to the devil. He's gone to the flesh. Satan is not primarily engaged in getting people drunk and into the ditch. Satan operates primarily in the realm of religion. Our Lord said, and it's recorded in the 8th chapter of John, You are of your father the devil. Now I take it that just a mere unbeliever is not designated so by the Lord Jesus. Our Lord was speaking to a special group of people when he said this. He was speaking to the religious rulers of his day. Here the enemy comes and sows tares, an over of the field with his agents, his emissaries. You recall that um, Paul and Barnabas were on their way to Cyprus. They were going to a town on the island, a town by the name of Paphos. They were going there to give the word of God to a man by the name of Sergius Paulus. And when they reached the outskirts of that town, they were met by a sorcerer named Elymas. And the Apostle Paul, filled with the Holy Spirit, fastened his eyes on Elymas and said to him, Thou child of the devil. What was Elymas doing? Why, he was engaged in a religious practice. That's what he was doing. But he was the emissary. He was the agent of Satan. Beloved, we live in an age... This age, while Christ is absent and rejected, in which Satan is sowing tares in the field. Not only false profession, but very error 
in its fruit. I have something to say about that in a few minutes. Notice at what time this sowing takes place. Verse 25, while men slept. When's that? Well, that's nighttime. And darkness is the symbol of Satan quite often in the scriptures. Nighttime, what's that? That's the present age. The sun set at Calvary. The last glimpse that the world had of Jesus Christ was his dying form upon that cross. Following his resurrection, the world never saw him again. During those 40 days of post-resurrection ministry, he appeared to his disciples. Some 10 appearances, but only to his own. The world did not see him. During this time of darkness, this night time, oh, human beings say, this is man's day. No, it's night. I have in uh, my library a book by great evangelist of the past generation, Dr. William E. Biederwolf. The book is entitled, The World's Saturday Night. That's where we're living. That's the age in which we live. It's a time of darkness. And during the time of darkness, when the sun has set, it is the moon that gives light. And the church of Jesus Christ is the spiritual moon for this time of darkness. Not only do we reflect the light of the sun, we have that very light and life dwelling in us today. But it's during this time of darkness, while men sleep, that Satan oversows the field with tares. During the night of Christ's absence, while men sleep, he sows his children among the children of the kingdom. Look, please, in the fifth chapter of 1 Thessalonians. Verse 5. 1 Thessalonians 5. You are all sons of light and sons of the day. We are not of the night nor of darkness. Therefore, let us not sleep as others do, but let us watch and be sober. For those who sleep, sleep at night. Those who get drunk are drunk at night. But let us who are of the day be sober, putting on the breastplate of faith and love, and as a helmet, the hope of salvation. For God did not appoint us to wrath, but to obtain salvation through our Lord Jesus Christ. And the activity of the enemy continues during this time of darkness. Praise God, you and I have the privilege as children, as sons of light, to shine in this time of darkness. Actually, this work of Satan began even before the canon of Scripture was completed. Look, please, there's a couple of verses in Second Peter, chapter 2. The Apostle Peter writes, and he says, But there were also false prophets among the people, even as there will be false teachers among you, who will secretly bring in destructive heresies, even denying the Lord who bought them, and bring on themselves swift destruction. And many will follow their destructive ways, because of whom the way of truth will be blasphemed. Jude speaks of these also in the fourth verse of his epistle. For certain men have crept in unawares, or unnoticed, who long ago were marked out for this condemnation, ungodly men, who turn the grace of our God into lewdness and deny the only Lord God and our Lord Jesus Christ. Now, Satan never announces their parentage. That's why the enemy sowed tares in the field. 
because they looked like the genuine. Paul said in, in 2 Thessalonians chapter 2 that the mystery of iniquity or lawlessness does already work. Now, beloved, if that was true in Paul's day, and it was, how much more so today as we approach the end of the age? John, in his first epistle, chapter 2, verse 18, said, Even now there are many antichrists. And if that was true in John's day, and it was, how much more so today? I take it that as we approach the end of the age, Satan will intensify his efforts. We have reason to believe today that we are seeing some of that. That he is zeroing in in this work of deception as we come to the end of the age. Now, what's the method that he employs? Well, he's an imitator. He imitates, he mimics, he counterfeits. The enemy did not sow thorns or thistles. They would have been easily detected and removed. But he sowed a degenerate wheat. And Satan has found that for his purposes, this is a far better way for him to go. Moses and Aaron wrought mighty miracles. But along with Moses and Aaron, there was Jans and Jambres. And Jans and Jambres performed miracles, the appearance of which were like those which Moses and Aaron performed, up to a certain point. They were the agents of Satan. They counterfeited God's miracles by lying wonders. Would you be interested in um, a short course on counterfeiting this morning? Some of you look like you could use a few extra bills today. Let me give you a short course this morning. If you're going to do any counterfeiting, you have to have some paper, of course, if you're going to counterfeit uh, paper currency. Really doesn't make any difference what kind of paper you have. Just most any kind will do. If you haven't uh, reverted entirely to plastic bags, maybe you can find one of those old brown paper bags. And... Uh, cut it in the right size and then of course you're going to have to have some some ink printer's ink preferably but if you can't find that you can stop in at the five and ten um, uh, the, the 50 cent and one dollar store <laughs> and uh, get you a bottle of Carter's ink and then you'll need someone to engrave some plates for you, and uh, you may find some fellow that was never very successful in the business, but he could uh, he could give you a good price on the engraving of some some plates, and then find you an old Harris uh, press or similar, and uh, slap on the plate and load the paper and put the ink in the well and uh, start it and after a while you'll turn out some uh, some lovely bills you say well that's that's plum foolish I agree you'll end up in Uncle Sam's boys town in Atlanta and I'll come to visit you of course that isn't the way a counterfeiter secures the very finest paper possible as near the genuine article as he can get it the right texture, the correct weight, the right shade. And then he secures the very finest printer's ink possible. That which is just as near the original and the genuine as he can find. 
and then with a fine press that has hairline registration on it. With that paper and ink loaded and plates that are photographically produced, he will crank out that which is counterfeit, and he will make the counterfeit just as near the genuine article as he can produce it. Dear friends, Satan is a master counterfeiter. You and I need discernment in these days. If ever the Church of Jesus Christ needed discernment, it is the day in which we live. So why John says in his first epistle, chapter 4, Try the spirits. Test the spirits, whether they be of God or not. I believe that there are two things necessary if you and I are to have spiritual discernment in the day in which we live. Number one, that we know the Word of God. No possibility of spiritual discernment apart from a knowledge of the Word of God. That means that daily you and I commit ourselves to the study of this blessed book. And secondly, that we are filled with the Holy Spirit, that we are controlled by the Holy Spirit. I think this is evident uh, in the case of uh, Paul and Barnabas and their confrontation of this man, Elymas. The apostle, filled with the Holy Spirit, set his eyes on him and said, May God give to you and me spiritual discernment in these days when Satan is involved in his work of counterfeiting, sowing tares among the wheat. He has an imitation gospel. Galatians 1, those believers in the church there had turned to a different gospel which Paul says is not a gospel. Satan has, an imit has imitation ministers. Look with me, please, to the 11th chapter of 2 Corinthians. 2 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 13. For such are false apostles, deceitful workers, transforming themselves into the apostles of Christ. And no wonder, for Satan himself transforms himself into an angel of light. Therefore, it is no great thing if his ministers also transform themselves into ministers of righteousness, whose end will be according to their works. Satan has an imitation righteousness. Those who have a form of godliness and deny the power thereof. Satan has an imitation church, which will finally be headed up known as Babylon. I believe that the old Babylonish cult joined with apostate Protestantism will form that great world church. It will be Satan's imitation church. And finally, he will foist upon this world his supreme counterfeit in the person of the lawless one, the man of sin. And Paul tells us in the second chapter of Second Thessalonians that that one, the lawless one, will come with all signs and lying wonders. Satan's engaged in the work of counterfeiting. Notice here in the parable that there is no opposition or hindrance to the growth of the tares. Verse 30, that when finally they're gathered, they will be gathered in bundles. This tells us that there will be many of them, for Satan is the god of this age. The world rejected the sovereign from heaven. The Jews preferred Barabbas to be released instead of Christ. They've reaped what they've sown. And the world has been under the control of a murderer ever since. Is it any wonder then that when the 
tares are gathered, there will be bundles of them. Now here's a startling truth. I'm sure a truth that never enters the minds of, uh, of those who are wicked. The presence of God's children in the field, the children of the kingdom, keeps back the wrath of God upon the devil's children. Remember, this deals with Christendom. It's not talking about the assembly, the church, the true church, the assembly of God. There is the responsibility in the local assembly of believers to purge out the old leaven. You know what that is. That's church discipline, which is not practiced much today in any of our churches. But there is this responsibility in the local assembly, the assembly of believers. But only the angel reapers can separate the wheat from the tares. That's why, dear friends, I wouldn't give you a plug nickel for most of the reform movements that are afoot today in America. I fear that sometimes we may spend an awful lot of valuable, precious time and precious money investing in reform movements that will never get the job accomplished. I come back to the 15th of Acts. Simeon hath declared how that God for the first time did visit the Gentiles to take out of them a people for his name. God's not involved in writing the social inequities of our time. That's not what God's doing. God's taking out of the nations a people for the name of Christ. I would urge you, as I do my own soul today, to be involved, to be taken up with what God is concentrating upon. The principal one of evangelization, as God by His Spirit and His Word fashioning a bride for Christ, a body for His Son, an eternal brotherhood. This is what God is doing in this age. Notice, please, the time of the harvest, verse 39. The harvest is the end of the age, or the consummation of the age. Now, I would suggest to you, and will you look with me, please, to the 14th chapter of the Revelation. I would suggest to you that what we read here in the 14th chapter of the Revelation correlates, is parallel, coincides with what takes place in this parable as the angel reapers gather the tares to burn them. Let's begin reading at verse 14. Then I looked, and behold, a white cloud, and on the cloud sat one like the Son of Man, having on his head a golden crown, and in his hand a sharp sickle. And another angel came out of the temple, crying with a loud voice to him who sat on the cloud, Thrust in your sickle and reap, for the time has come for you to reap, for the harvest of the earth is ripe. So he who sat on the cloud thrust in his sickle on the earth, and the earth was reaped. Then another angel came out of the temple, which is in heaven, he also having a sharp sickle. And another angel came out of the altar, who had power over fire, and he cried with a loud cry to him who had the sharp sickle, saying, Thrust in your sharp sickle, and gather the clusters of the vine of the earth, for her grapes are fully ripe. So the angel thrust his sickle into the earth and gathered the vine of the earth and threw it into the great winepress of the wrath of God. I believe this portion lines up with what we've just read in the parable of the harvest that will come at the consummation of the age. Now note this. From the wording in this chapter, I take it that the 
tares are gathered into bundles before the wheat is actually garnered, and that there is the separation of the tares in the field, that the wheat is gathered into the barn before the tares are burned. This would seem to be uh, the chronological order as uh, mentioned here in the parable. This process of binding the tares into bundles. Certainly, uh, we're not seeing this today, but I think we may be seeing a prelude or a preview of this today as you take every area of our social circle that this bundle business is taking place in the commercial no longer the individual that's important, but it's the trust and the combine and the corporation and the conglomerate bundles. So it is in the social, with clubs and guilds and unions and social barriers being broken down. So it is in the ecclesiastical, the push for unification the great ecumenical movement, bundles, bundles. It's true in the international. And I say, we are not seeing this binding into bundles, but perhaps this is even a preview of what will take place at the end of the age. There's coming, dear friends, a time of doom and a time of glory. Verse 42 and will cast them into the furnace of fire. There will be wailing and gnashing of teeth. Then the righteous will shine forth as the sun in the kingdom of their Father. He who has ears to hear, let him hear. All of this points to a time yet future. Uh, let's read one verse from the third chapter of Matthew. And these are the words of John the Baptizer. Well, two verses, verses 11 and 12 of Matthew 3. John said, I indeed baptize you with water unto repentance, but he who is coming after me is mightier than I, whose sandals I am not worthy to carry. He will baptize you with the Holy Spirit and fire. Of course, the baptism with the Holy Spirit took place on the day of Pentecost. This is what John the Baptizer is speaking about. What about the baptism with fire? The next verse tells us what that is. His winnowing fan is in his hand, and he will thoroughly clean out his threshing floor and gather his wheat into the barn, but he will burn up the chaff with unquenchable fire. There's coming a baptism with fire. I believe it's the same judgment spoken of in this second parable of the mysteries of the kingdom of heaven. And certainly this comes, I believe, at the end of the tribulation period, the tares into judgment, and the wheat into the garner, that is, into the millennial age. I do not see in this parable of the tares anything that has to do here with the rapture of the church. This is what occurs at the end of the age. After the church has been raptured and with the Lord Jesus, but the righteous of the tribulation period, and there will be those who will be saved during the tribulation period, will be taken into the kingdom, the millennial age. The tares will be gathered into bundles to be burned. The next event on God's prophetic calendar is the rapture of the church, the catching away of the body of Christ. But this judgment of the tares will occur at the end of the age.